A couple of years before I, uh, I learned more about capacitors than anybody should, I worked at um, a scope company. And so at the end, I'm going to ask which company I worked for because I want to see if you guys can figure out which one. Now, if you know my history, that doesn't count. All right. So, let's see, is that working? Yeah. All right. So, how many people in this room have used an oscilloscope? Okay. All right. Well, it's good to see you. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Let me, I'll stand over here. So, then let me ask this. How many of you have seen inside of an oscilloscope? Okay, good. So this is a board that I happen to have pictures of for some reason. Um, and so all I want to do here is just say, this is actually the front end module. And then this is a couple of A to Ds, the memory controller, and the memory. Now the really cool thing was, this, is like a, uh, this was like a 12 gigahertz scope. And so this front end module is actually this, it's an MCM. And this is the MCM with the lid open. And so I'm just going to go real quick. This is like the attenuator stage. So when you're going and you're turning the knobs, that's what's showing up here. This is the actual preamp. This is a flat. So it's a 12 gig preamp. It's literally flat from 0 to, to 12 gigahertz. And then on either side are these flip-flops. And so what's interesting about the flip-flops is that they're here to do an edge trigger. And so originally, I wanted to spend like an hour talk to you guys about how a trigger works. And then as I started putting my thoughts together, I realized I need to explain a whole lot of other things before I get to the trigger. And so what's funny is this is the thing that made me want to talk, and it's the smallest thing on the picture, right? OK. So this is a scope screen. Um, the only thing I was going to point out here is, first of all, um, I'm of a newer generation, and so I do believe that using graticules on a scope screen are stupid. It turns out that all digital scopes have measurements, and the measurements are way better than you going one, two, three, four times. 2.5 is. <laughs> so just want to point out, if you're using a digital scope, by all means, use the measurements. The other thing, and this, this isn't as much of an issue with newer scopes, but if a, if a sampling or a real-time scope doesn't show you what its sample rate and memory depth are, I would be very suspicious about what it's doing. Because if it's not showing you, then that's really critical information. And I'm going to give you an example of why that's critical later on. Now, this magic point, this is our trigger point. So I told the scope to trigger on something. In that case, I told it a negative edge at 2.2 volts. Okay? So at the end, I'm going to talk to you about this part of it. So when we step back and look at an oscilloscope, here's the really, really, when, when I was working at, well, I've actually worked at two scope companies. When I worked with scopes, the thing that I found fascinating is practically everybody involved in the design is an electrical engineer. And there were cases where we were actually debugging our scopes with our prototype scopes because we were trying to find problems, right? And so if we just step back, I showed you the picture, but let's look at a block diagram because you're going to see this over and over. Like I said, there's always an attenuator stage. That's how you get 10 millivolts or 100 millivolts per division. There's a preamplifier, and that preamplifier is driving the signal into an A to D. And there's lots we could talk about these amps. There's two comments I'll make. The first one is when you sort of, once I was actually asked, why do you need a preamp at all? And if one reason you could say it's, it's a buffer for the A to Ds, depending on how the A to D is set up, it may be a huge load. The other aspect of it is A to Ds and the guys that design them are very picky and they only like signals in a certain dynamic range. And so the whole point of this front end is to make your signal be compatible with this guy. Now, the second story I'm going to talk about, now, you know what, I'm going to come back to that one. All right, so the A to D takes our analog, turns it into digital, gets stored into memory. Now, this is why I have a note down on this one, because I'm showing this memory controller in parallel with these guys. Depending on the architecture of the class scope, the manufacturer, this might be in the middle of it, 
whatever. But the idea is there's some kind of controller that's handling the acquisition memory. And if you step back and think about it, um, if we use a what's kind of considered a low-end scope today that has a one giga sample per second A to D, it's capturing one gigabyte of data every second. And so you need something that can handle that memory, both go, or that data, both going into the memory as well as when we go and offload it to the computer. Okay? Now, sometimes these memory controllers, again, depending on the class of scope, they may actually have some data acceleration built into them. And so these can actually become some of the most complicated ICs in the entire scope. Now, all of that's driven by a time base, uh, which I'm going to come back to in a little bit. You almost always have some kind of computer, either it's an embedded 32-bit ARM, or it can even be a PC, depending on the class of scope. Now, is there anything missing in this block diagram? Oh yeah, the trigger. <laughs> the thing I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna get to the trigger, and, what, and I'll say this a couple times, but the thing that I love about the trigger is it detects stuff that's analog in a stream of digital. And so we're gonna talk about what that means. All right, so starting with the amplifier. Um, as you can see, I have a no-name scope here. Um, <laughs> and the reason I took the name off, because you know, I'm sure nobody could recognize who it is, is I, I, I want to make fun of it for a minute. So let's call it a one gigahertz scope. See, it says one gigahertz, kept that. That's a one gigahertz sine wave. When I put it in the scope, even though that was one volt peak to peak, I only got 700 millivolts on my screen. Why? Well, as you know, like all amplifiers, there is some response to the front end. And so scopes are measured at their 3 dB point. Now, here's the thing that's not as uh, well known or understood. This is what you would see in an entirely analog scope. You'd see a nice Gaussian response. And what it really meant was your 100 megahertz scope was really a 250 megahertz if you could deal, deal with the fact that it was highly attenuated. Now, Today, it's not as big of a problem, but early digital scopes where the sample rate and the analog bandwidth were basically butting up against each other, and by the way, it's not the Nyquist problem, it's actually Shannon, but we can talk about that afterwards. The problem we were running into there is that the sample rate was just as fast as the analog bandwidth, and so we wanted to make sure we didn't have any aliasing. And so what's kind of become common with digital scopes is they don't have a Gaussian response. They have more of a, what we call the brick wall response. And so you still have your loss at the magic 3 dB point, but the roll off is ridiculously fast compared to an analog scope. So your 100 megahertz scope is pretty much a 100 megahertz scope, okay? Now, like I said, this is becoming less of an issue because A to Ds are getting fast enough, but that's just one thing to keep in mind is that everybody shows the scope response that looks like this, and that's fine if the scope was from 25 years ago. Most of the digital scopes look more like this now. Okay, let's move on to acquiring the signal. So in a real-time scope, I'm gonna try to move over here now. Let's say we have a sample rate of one giga sample. Take the inverse of that, that gets us our sample period. So one giga sample A to D is going to sample our waveform every nanosecond. Today it's kind of slow. 15 years ago, that was fast. So now let's bring back my friend, the uh, sine wave, and let's not try to do the math because I didn't bother to make sure that one gigahertz made sense. <laughs> Basically what we know with the sampling scope, is, or a real-time sampling scope, is that every nanosecond, it's gonna go off and make a acquisition. Now, before I move on, can anyone tell already, just by looking at the dots, something unique about this signal? There's a little bit of a shift, and it's because it's not really a sine wave. And so it's funny because I, it's not a sine wave. It's a filter and illustrator that makes things look like a sine wave, but they're not. <laughs> and it's, it's painfully obvious when I look at it because the sampling's correct, but you can see that the dots are not in the right place. So it's a real signal. Okay, so once we go off and we acquire some samples, um, each of these samples gets stored into memory. And so what I'm trying to demonstrate here is, in a real-time scope, you have a ring buffer that stores the acquisition samples. And so this guy is going off and it's just storing and storing and storing and storing. 
we need some kind of magic event to occur to tell to stop doing this and then pass the data off to the computer. Any idea what that magic event is called? Yeah, it's called the trigger. Okay. Now I'm going to come back to this in a second, and I just want to point out that this is a very complicated design. It's got a 13-word memory. Um, but because of that, I made it like a 400-bit A to D, so it's extremely accurate. Now, before we go off and look at memory, or go look at this on the screen, I want to bring something up. And this was something that when I was working with scopes, always seemed to surprise engineers and would sort of create a discussion. I'll use that word nicely. So I have my memory controller over here. I'm going to stand in front of that. And I'm trying to get my information up on the screen, uh, up on the display. But the very first thing we do with the data when we pull it out of the A to D is that we do these DSP corrections. So I want to point this out because there's two things that can be occurring here. Number one is, remember I said you've got that attenuator stage and the preamp is conditioning the signal? Well, the A to D has no idea whether the signal coming in is a 1 volt or 10 volts. So part of this is to correct the raw A to D data to be useful to the rest of our measurement. The other side of it is, I showed an example of a 12 gigahertz scope. Even at 100 megahertz, how flat do you think the response of the amplifier is going to be? Is it going to be perfectly flat when we go and manufacture it? Well, of course not. You know, cost. Uh, speed and um, accuracy. You get two of them. Now, the reason I point that out is because what generally happens when scopes are built, the amplifier goes through a bunch of calibrations and then it gets flattened out with this, these DSP corrections. Now, I used to work with a company that um, had some brilliant engineers involved in them, uh, involved with them. And they were always asking us as a scope manufacturer, just give me the raw data. We don't care about this. Just give me the raw data, give me the raw data, give me the raw data. And I always thought it was interesting because as a processor, I mean, a digital company, they seemed to think they knew better how to correct an RF amplifier than we did. And I found that even more interesting because one time, here's the story I skipped, uh, I was talking to a guy at our, our RF division, and he said, I don't get why you're making such a big deal about the noise floor of your scope. We've got an amplifier that's twice the bandwidth and half the noise. You guys are doing something wrong. I said, well, yeah, ours goes down to DC. He said, well, mine does too. It's like, well, no, I mean DC. He goes, yeah. He goes, 500 megahertz or 500 hertz or kilohertz, what's the difference? <laughs> I was like, no, man, we go to zero. He's like, how do you do that? It's like, well, you make the noise twice as high <laughs> and at half the bandwidth. So, you know, it takes a lot to get a flat response out of these things, and this really helps. Now, the other area that becomes controversial is almost every scope applies some amount of interpolation between the sample points. And what I found is there's two camps. There's the people that like this and the people that don't. Now, if you're one of the people that don't, calm down. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you you have to use this, but in a minute, I'm going to tell you why this exists, okay? If you don't like Sinex interpolation, that's OK. But you actually need it. <laughs> and then there's this thing called linear interpolation, which I've never understood why scope companies like to talk about it. I think it's, I think it's like a junior engineer. I always imagined it was a junior engineer that worked really hard on this feature. And so we had to give it a cool name. Uh, most scopes just call that connect the dots. So, <laughs> but you know, it's something that happens. So all this stuff has to happen before you can display something on the screen. So let's talk about displaying for a second. And I'm going to, and I already know I did this backwards, but go with me for a second. So here's my sample points again. You know, most people, if you throw that up on a screen, they're not going to be very happy. You can't really see a whole lot with that. So that's where we do this linear interpolation, so we connect the points together. But if you notice, and if you look closely, at each of these sample points, there is a very sharp turn as the vector changes direction. Is that real? No, not at all, right? Number one, maybe it is real in the signal. Could be. It's not, but it could be. At the B and C. At the A to D, though, 
it's impossible for the signal to look this way because we know there's an amplifier sitting in front of it that has a known system bandwidth. So when you do something like applying a sine x over x interpolation, while we are adding additional points between the sample points, the other thing we're doing is better recreating the signal as it exists in front of the A to D. Now again, this may not be what happens at the B and C, but our goal is to at least show you what the A to D can see, okay? Now, if you still don't believe me that sine x over x is important, I've got one more example. Now, um, I was on a forum and I saw somebody post a, a, a picture or a, a question and I almost tried to uh, make the talk all about this, but well, not this one, but they basically came out and said, hey, I have a regal scope and when I make a frequency measurement, it's inaccurate, this thing is trash. And so I thought about actually doing a talk on all the things that people do wrong when they evaluate scopes because this was a classic example. And so what was going on is um, let me back up. So he told, he, in his post, he said he had 134 meg kilohertz signal. And when he looked at a single cycle, he got exactly what he expected. But then when he zoomed out, he was starting to measure like 131. And depending on some other settings he changed, he could see like 138. So clearly this scope is trash, right? I mean, it can't even measure 130 hertz, kilohertz signal correctly. Okay, any ideas why this is, this is the same signal, it's the same scope, why would I get three different measurements from the same signal? Who said the pixels? Okay, you're both right. Remember I said it's really important to see what the sample rate is. There is a piece of information missing in all of this. How many sample points is the measurement system using? And this is something that is not well described by any manufacturers and everybody does something slightly different. So let me explain what's going on then I'm gonna come back to this example. So here I have a pulse. And I didn't draw it out, but let's say I was trying to measure the frequency or the pulse width. So ideally, I want to get it at the threshold voltage, right? So what's happening by default in almost every scope, and I, so far I've never encountered a scope that doesn't do this by default, they use a 1090 for the thresholds. Who knows what 1090 means? <laughs> correct, correct. Yeah, I, I sort of set you up on that one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, 80, yeah, exactly. So if we step back, what's going on is the scope has to have a threshold point in order to make a measurement. And so the default is it evaluates the edge and it figures out where's the start, where's the stop, and then the threshold must be at the 50% point. Now, depending on the class of scope, you have a lot of control over that, but it's important to think about this because this means every time the scope makes the measurement, it is evaluating every edge as if it knows nothing. So it figures out, oh, I don't know, this must be the zero point. But keep in mind, the scope doesn't see the signal. It sees the sample data. And so the sample data, and let's just use this as an example, might be these three points. So then what happens? Well, we turn on linear interpolation and we say, okay, let's assume that you know, we don't want to interpolate anything. Well, is this a good representation of the signal? No. And then what happens? When the scope goes to look for the 1090 points, it's gonna start shifting around because, hey, this, this edge looks different than what's really there. So it ends up, say, making this the 50% point. Well, that's gonna start throwing things off. Now, let's say you were in my favorite camp and said that uh, interpolation is okay. Well, if we go and interpolate four to one, which pretty average, 
we now get a signal that looks much, much closer to what our actual signal was doing. So then when I go and evaluate that edge and figure out, okay, well, where's the 50% point? And I didn't draw it, but it's where it's supposed to be, okay? So there's a couple of things to think about here. Number one is um, if you really are worried about the precision of a measurement, do not use 1090 or 2080. Tell the scope what voltage to measure at, okay? Because that way it's not, it takes out the variability. It says, okay, here's what I see at that voltage point. The second thing is measurement systems almost always interpolate between the sampled points so that they can properly characterize an edge. Almost always. That's what we're seeing on the, the example here. Hold that thought for a second. Hold, hold that thought, I'm gonna come back to that, because yeah. The, and actually you're making a really good point is, okay, well, but the, the trigger circuit is looking at a specific voltage point and it sees everything. I'm gonna come back to that disconnect. You, you almost took my thunder away. <laughs> so here's, here's what was going on. When we were looking at a single cycle on screen, this class of scope only does measurement based on the data set on screen. Even though I think mine has like 10 million sample points in the acquisition memory, it only looks at the four or 500 points on the screen. And so in this case, it's like, well, gosh, you know, there's only, there's only so many points on the screen. It does a bunch of interpolation. The update rate stays really fast. I get a very accurate measurement. When you zoom out, yeah, the sample rate changes, but that's actually not the problem. It's now the acquisition memory has increased and the scope is going, well, okay, I can either make an accurate measurement or I can make the screen flicker. This class of scope makes the screen flicker in favor of or in, um, at the expense of accuracy. So when you start to zoom out and you get a bunch more stuff on screen, it's no longer interpolating the data when it goes to do the measurement. And so it's just misplacing its edge. So it, at least in the case of a Regal, the way you solve that, this is the full acquisition or partial acquisition. They have, um, it's, it's called zoom. Some scopes call it zoom, some call it delayed. But basically you tell the scope, I wanna zoom in on the waveform because now the measurement system will use the on-screen data for its measurement, okay? If you couldn't tell my, my uh, my passive aggressive comment here is, be careful when you throw out that accusation that this scope must suck because it can't even, and then I've got a hundred things we could talk about that people throw in there. To me, this is a classic example because the scope is working exactly how it was designed. Now we can argue whether this is a good design or not, but that's, that has, you know, the scope is as accurate as it is, okay? Oh yeah. That, well, what a really good scope would do is it would look at the entire acquisition and then it would determine from the entire acquisition what the whole thing looks like. The real problem here is that we're looking at one sample or one cycle at a time. And so that, I mean, there's, Well, it's actually funny because the older class or the older generation of Regals did have a frequency counter it built in. And when the, the guy first brought it up, I was like, oh, that's the problem. And then I started looking into it and this newer generation doesn't. And so no, this was just a totally a threshold thing. I, I, should, have, I should have shown it. I think, if, uh, I think I have a screenshot somewhere where I, I set the thresholds and it was correct. But yeah, yeah, uh, the right way to do this measurement is not with the scope, right? Okay, any other comments? All right, all right, let's talk about trigger. And this isn't, this isn't the same thing as watching, uh, watching a certain person's Twitter feed. <laughs> so here's the main question. What does a trigger do? So if we come back to our acquisition memory, right? We're storing our waveform. Here I'm representing the waveform and the sample points. 
the trigger says, I want to find an analog voltage that crosses this point. So there's an actual circuit, and I'm going to show you an example of it, that's watching for that and says, aha, it happened at sample three. And then it goes off and it tells the memory controller, hey, I found our samples at number three. And then the computer or the memory controller lines things back up and says, okay, I know where the trigger point is at. So let's talk about how we make that happen. Who here remembers building an edge trigger like in Digital Circuits 201, right? Turns out it's not much more complicated than that. The edge trigger, the most common trigger used in an oscilloscope is basically a delay line and an and or, or gate. So this is an example of here's how we find a positive edge, here's how we find a negative edge. Um, if you think back to that early circuits class, what other gate or a, a circuit do you find an OR or an OR and an AND or an AND gate? Hmm? XOR. XOR? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little more complicated. A flip-flop. And remember, I said way back in the front end module of the scope that I was showing as an example, edge triggers, now it's more complicated than this, but edge triggers are basically just a flip-flop. They're, and they're programmable. You can tell it, I want to look for a rising or falling edge. So let's just say we have a thing called an edge detector, and it's programmable. So the, what has to sit in front of it so we can find this threshold is a comparator. And by the way, most trigger circuits or the preamp will have a second buffer to buffer the trigger circuit from the rest of the acquisition, but we're going to kind of ignore that for a second. So this is basic block diagram for an edge trigger and a scope. But those aren't the fun ones. So I'm going to give you four examples, and we're going to talk about how does this trigger circuit detect these four examples. So the thing I added in this circuit is a counter or a timer, and then something to control the logic of what's going on. So down over here, everyone see the pulse width? Pulse width, the idea, or frequency, period, you know, it's all the same thing, just different software. I need to detect the time from this point to this point, right? Now, one way we could do this is we could say, OK, set up my comparator for a rising edge. And then as soon as I see it, reprogram yourself to watch for a falling edge. The upside of this approach is that's a really cheap circuit to build because you only need one comparator. The downside is you fundamentally limit it, your pulse width that you can detect. Now, the other thing that limits it, and this is more realistic, is how fast is that counter running and what resolution does it have? But it's a pretty simple idea, right? You see a rising edge, you see a falling edge, and you count the time in between it. And then you can create all kinds of triggers around that. So let's make it a little more complicated. What if I want to do a delay trigger where I'm looking at the time delay between uh, channels one and two, or two signals? Maybe I'm trying to do like a setup and hold violation. Well, in this case, I want two rising edges. But the problem is, how do I get my signal from here to here? Okay, it's not that complicated. We just add another comparator. Okay, and then basically we say, okay, comparator one watches this one, comparator two watches this one, and then our 8-bit micro keeps track of what's going on between the two. Magic trigger signals happen. Okay, what about this one? So some, some scopes call it slope, some will say slew rate, some will call it rise time trigger. Basically, I want to count, you know, I'm looking for a certain rise time or rise time violation. Well, if everyone turns their head this way, what you'll notice is this picture and this picture are nearly identical. The only difference is the amount of time between them. It's the same idea. I have a rising edge and a rising edge. I count the time between them. That's how I set up my trigger. I didn't add any other hardware. Two comparators and um, one counter. OK. Now, the worst name but most interesting trigger I've ever found for analog is a runt. Uh, runt signal is basically you have a signal where the, there's a pulse within the train that doesn't quite go up to a second level. And so here we can see this is, a, this is a proper voltage. This guy is not coming up as high as it should, so it's a runt. Now, if I just look at the diagram, I can see there are one, two, three, four, five, six comparator points. So in order to do that trigger, do I go and duplicate this circuit six times? No. Instead, what you do is you fire the guy that came up with that idea, and you hire somebody that can actually do logic. 
Because if you think about it, what I'm trying to find out is, do I ever go past this second threshold? So all you have to do is watch this threshold and this th threshold, because this one and this one are the same. So if you see this one get tripped twice, you know a runt occurred. Now, I picked these four because to me, they represent most of the types of triggers that are built into modern scopes. Now, you might have a whole nother, you know, another 20 or so modes, but they're all basically these same modes using this relatively simple hardware. Now, I want to be really stressed the relatively simple because um, I used to be really good friends with the guy that designed our trigger circuits, and I don't want him to find out that I called his circuit simple. <laughs> but this is basically what it comes down to. All of that cool functionality and things you do in a scope comes down to two comparators and a counter. Okay. Okay. Now, let's come back to this uh, picture. Because I, I, I sort of painted a rosy picture and this one isn't valid. I said, let's pick a threshold like this and notice I had a sample point that just happened right on the threshold. Sound like a familiar problem, right? Well, the reality is you almost always will miss the measurement point. And so, for example, you know, the real threshold is going to occur between these two. And so what does your memory controller and trigger circuit do in that case? Well, here's what most scopes do is they paint a picture that looks like this. And so this is a repetitive trigger with the infinite persistence. And what you can see is it's kind of fat. And if we look at the histogram, it's got a nice shape to it, right? So we can see that this thing is basically randomly moving around at the key trigger point. Now, why am I making a big deal about this particular part? Because um, after a decade of not being in the scope business, I can finally say this out loud. So what's going on here is this is actually accumulation of errors. One of the bigger, biggest contributing factors is that the acquisition point right here does not or this analog voltage point does not line up to an acquisition point. And so the scope software doesn't really quite know where to paint the waveform. The other thing is there's probably vertical noise in the signal, and that's causing the waveform to move around a little bit. Another one could be the time base maybe isn't as accurate as it could be. So we're going to see a little bit there. So trigger jitter is accumulation of errors. Now the reason I bring it up is because those three things are all things I've heard scope companies, including the ones I worked for, use as the reasons why trigger jitter is a great way to evaluate a scope. I think it's total BS. Because it, there's, there's only a handful of measurements that this matter. And really, if, if your circuit, if, if you're doing like setup and hold and you're trying to you know, look at something going into a memory chip and this is the margin you have left, the trigger jitter of the scope is not your problem. Right? <laughs> the other thing is if you're looking at a serial a data signal where the clock is embedded within the signal, uh, which is where another place, because you're talking about high-speed signals, uh, it doesn't matter because you're looking at the signal relative to itself. The, the trigger point is actually completely arbitrary. It doesn't matter. Okay. Also, and this is very common now, here's a scope, same setup, different vendor. Notice that its trigger point is nearly perfect, and the histogram is only a couple of points. Guess what? Remember on the measurements, we can look at the edge and kind of figure out where the point actually was. Well, why don't we just do the same thing with our trigger point? If I know it happened between samples two and three, why don't I just put halfway between two and three in the middle of the screen? And so, and I'm starting to see this more and more on uh, scopes now, is they're all incorporating some trigger jitter removement. The reason I wanted to bring it up is because I still, in fact, in pulling together some last minute research, I was still finding vendors with recent application notes trying to talk about how trigger jitter shows how great their blah, 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 blah is. It doesn't matter. You can remove all trigger jitter with software. Okay? All right. I got one more thing I want to cover. And this was because um, I wanted to make sure I talked about it. But it's an area that I have no personal experience, but I'm going to tell you about it. So Rotary and Schwartz was known, is, is known uh, very well for their, um, for their RF uh, equipment. A couple of years ago, they came out with a series of digital scopes. And the one innovation that I wanted to bring to light is 
they're the first digital scope that has a truly digital trigger system. And so here we've been talking about basically using the entire analog system to find events, which identify events in a digital stream. They're actually doing signal processing of the A to D stream itself. And so, you know, I can see lots of advantages to this, right? You don't, you don't have a limit of the number of comparators. Maybe the timers can be more precise. The downside is they're dealing with a ton of data, so there's gonna be some fundamental limits on what they measure. But I thought it was really cool that in like 25 years of digital scopes, somebody finally did something different with the trigger circuit than just add more comparators and timers, okay? All right, a couple of things to check out. Um, key site used to be Agilent, used to be HP. Um, <laughs> They've, uh, they've recently stepped up their video um, game, so they've got like a, really, a lot of really cool stuff. I mean, I had no idea this was going to happen. Uh, this week, they started a series on how, to, how they designed their preamps or their front ends. So if that circuit looked interesting, I think that might be something that's worth checking out. Um, Rodian Schwartz, uh, they've got a whole website dedicated to scopes. And then LaCroix, um, LaCroix does a lot of free uh, seminars, and yeah, they're trying to sell you a LaCroix scope, but they actually cover lots of, here's how to use scopes, here's things to watch out for. And so I just kind of recommend checking them out. They come out here quite a bit, so something to check. And then of course, there's this website with this guy. You can go there and download the slides, okay? All right, any guesses to which company I worked for? Everyone always guesses. You know, actually, we used to do, uh, we, we, we used to um, um, uh, market research, uh, what do you call it, when you uh, focus groups. And every time we did the focus group, the, the guy we had run them, he, he worked for us, he could get the audience to say, yeah, you guys obviously work for tech. Yeah, I've never worked for tech. Well, it was a tech scope. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, actually, I. The, the only way, no, it, it wasn't tech. The only way you would have actually known is that the, the picture I showed you of the insides were pictures I took, and so it was actually at Agilent. And then I, I did a little bit of time at LaCroix as well, but, um, but it, like I said, it's been far removed, so. All right, any questions? That I know of. Yeah, so that's like all in firmware. And, uh, but I just want to, like, are the trigger systems usually totally analog or is it like FPGAs or? So the, the core hardware is all analog, it, typically, right? So it, it's just like I showed, it, it's, a, it's a comparator and yeah. some stuff like that. Now, for more digital style triggers, like, say, uh, I squared C decode yeah. and things like that, then yeah, there's FPGAs involved. Yeah, this but, is most but like yeah, analog. yeah. But most trigger circuits are, are at the core in analog circuit. And so that's why when I, I mean, the other way, I guess the other way to look at it is, I, I don't know if they're using an FPGA, but they're basically taking in the, the raw A to D samples and processing that to find the trigger point. And that, I, I don't know of anyone that's done that. Anyone else that's done that. Is that the same? Yeah, actually, what they're doing, all they're doing is, oh, come on, all they're doing is they've got, um, so w they've got a dual path, so they're, I think their memory controller is throwing it into memory and into the trigger circuit, and then they're doing either a two-to-one or a four-to-one um, interpolation on the way in so that they can actually get a better resolution on the edge, but it looks like it's coming straight off the A to D. I mean, it, from what I understand and what I, what I was able to pull together is they are literally using the same samples to find the trigger point. And so it kind of comes back to the, we were talking about the measurement and the trigger, right? Well, the problem with the existing scopes is that the analog trigger, all it can do is say, hey, at this timestamp, something happened. Whereas this one, I mean, it's, it's literally saying, well, I found it. I mean, it's, it's right there, right? The downside is it's, it's completely digital. So what's the trade-off? And I'm sure there are some, but yeah. I just, like I said, I just think it's cool. It's finally, you know, 25 years, nobody's done anything. I mean, I, again, I don't want to disparage trigger circuit designers because they're really cool circuits, but it, it's basically been a lot of 
okay, let's just do the same thing but better and faster. This is completely different. Well, it's funny you say that, because I had a slide for that. <laughs> All right, and, and the reason I took this out is because I'm gonna say I did this and I didn't actually make this measurement, and I, so I didn't think it was actually fair. So I know this is a little bit hard to see on this screen, but here I've got a signal that takes up about 80% of the, sig the screen. And what I'm trying to do is I wanna see and evaluate this noise. Now in this situation, this particular scope didn't have an AC coupling capability. So I had to keep it DC, which meant I have to keep the, the step. So even though all I want is the noise, I can't, I can't kill it. So using a math function, I digitally zoomed in on the signal to get this waveform. And I can actually even see there's something funny going on here. There's a couple things over here. Now the alternative is I could have taken the offset and slammed the signal down. And so in theory, the signal is down here somewhere. Well, this voltage down here is outside the dynamic range of the A to D. And so number one, the A to D doesn't know how to sample it, so I'm getting errors. The other thing that's happening is that the preamp doesn't know how to handle this either, and it's going into overdrive. And so it's starting to actually create noise and bumps that don't exist. And it generally takes it some number of micro to milliseconds to calm back down. And so you end up with, this was what the real signal looked like, and this is what we sampled when we ended up overdrive. So one reason is overdrive recovery. You're, you're, actually, you're actually adding di uh, distortion when the signal goes off the screen, okay? Now, the other way to take your question is, and I don't have something for this, but I can make it work. So it's important to maximize this as much as possible. And it's because this screen represents the dynamic range of my A to D. And so if I look at this, it's just like, um, it's just like any kind of uh, analog sampling. This represents the number of steps. And so the more signal I get on the steps, the more accurate my sample points are going to be. If my signal takes up half the screen, I'm only getting half the resolution, and it's actually less than half the resolution of the A to D. And so the idea is I want to maximize the signal across A to D so that I get the best digitized signal. The only scope I think that does this really well is LaCroix. Uh, LaCroix scopes are intelligent enough that if you have two signals on screen and you say put half of it up here and half of it down here, it will split the screen into two grids and treat the two signals completely different. Almost every other scope keeps this as one one screen trying to spread the signal across. Is it expensive or difficult to add AC coupling? Is that why this scope wouldn't have it? Uh, when, when, when we built this one, it was, it was one of the first 10 plus gigahertz scopes, and at the time, yeah. Okay, something about that time was difficult. Yeah, it was, it was, it was yeah, we could do it, it'll take another two years, and yeah. One question. Generally, yeah. Uh, generally, yeah. Um, I, I didn't make this joke earlier. Um, some scope vendors use eight grids, some use 10. The ones that use 10 tell you that it's better, and the ones that use eight tell you that they're better. And what both sides are trying to get to is that there's some headroom above and below. In general, from what I understand, tech scopes tend to have a little more headroom above and below the screen so they can handle the overdrive a little bit better because their dynamic range extends a little bit farther than what you see on screen. Now, the guys that don't do that would argue, well, the problem with that is even if I make the signal full screen, you're still not fully digitizing it, so there's a little bit of noise in it or whatever. But it's, it's a general case that if you go off the screen, you're gonna cause problems. Now, the speed of the signal also matters. Like I said, I mean, this thing actually by about here is probably valid again, but who cares about that? The ringing's done. Speaking of overdrive, I mean, it's pretty amazing how the analog front end works, right? Because you can have a 
for a 10 millivolt uh, range and accidentally put a 5 volt signal on it, it's just totally fine. I mean, it goes totally off screen, but it's. It, it doesn't destroy it. Fire, it's like, oh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I guess there's some nice clamping guards. Yeah, and even before the attenuation stage, most scopes attenuate the signal anyway. So by the time the amplifier sees it, it's already it's already a fraction of what it was anyway. So does the sine echo or echo filter interact with the photon on screen? Yeah, poorly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in fact, I think that's that's what we're seeing. Well, that, that's what we ended up seeing in here. But yeah, I mean, it's it's basically garbage in, garbage out. And I would actually just kind of point to what, what happens, well, not on this one, because that's not real, is really what's going on here, right? The signal's clearly not flat. So the A to D is feeding the filter a bunch of noise. I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is. This can't be true. And then you know, eventually the, the, the interpolation catches up, so to speak. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely going to turn it off. Yeah, I was just thinking that too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you would see, yeah, actually that would be interesting to see if that, if that was affected by it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in that particular issue, the horizontal scale wasn't the source of the problem. Um, it was because a lot of people, including myself, initially thought, well, you're clearly not sampling it enough. Or the other thought I had was, okay, well, you're measuring a rise time that's way too fast for the scope. So that's not a, that's not a fair issue either. Um, but um, what I was trying, all I meant to say in that one was, you're, you're absolutely right. As you adjust the time base, you're going to change the sample rates and memory depths, and that does cause a change. The issue there was, as you, as you were putting more data on screen, it changed the way that the measurement system worked. And so the error was in the use of the measurement system, not necessarily that, you're, that he was doing the time base, but it, it was a secondary effect. It can, yeah. Yeah, just like I showed, typically if you get something where you want to look at a long time record, show that and then use the scope's zoom functions to get into the parts of the record that you're interested in. Right, which is why I, I don't trust scopes that don't tell me the sample rate. <laughs> yeah, because like I said, my, that was my first thought was, I'm like, well, clearly what's going on is it's dropping below, it's dropping below it's into like the megahertz range or mega sample range. It's distorting the edges, blah, blah, blah. But that wasn't it. It was just interpolating wrong. But yeah, yeah. I mean, if I have a choice between sample rate and memory depth, I want the fastest sample rate I can get at all times. The, the other reason to do, think about that too is um, all the DSP corrections I talked about, flattening out the amplifier and all those things, those typically only occur at like the top one or two sample rates because as you start to step away from the sample rate, the signal, there's not enough information there to recover the, the or do, to do the compensations. And so you want to stick to as fast as you can for things like all the filters to work correctly. Um, I got a whole nother uh, thing on that, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, I feel like about um, the whole lot of time on sequential <laughs> uh, I think it's a very general question. Does the whole lot of time affect any of the like that you have? How does that even work? So, okay. Um, real, and in fact, uh, I'm, I'm actually laughing because I was gonna, I was about to say, I can't believe nobody asked about hold off. I'll have to come back and talk about it. Um, so hold off basically is, it's how long does it take for the trigger system to rearm itself? So like in the case of like the pulse width, let's just say, or edge, keep it simple. After I see an edge, how long until the trigger system is ready again to detect the next edge? The other piece, so that's, that's for the trigger system. The other piece of hold off is how long until the acquisition system is ready to keep acquiring. And so what sometimes gets lost in that is the trigger circuit can rearm in 100 nanoseconds, but it takes 
50 milliseconds to offload the data from the memory into the CPU and display it on screen. So your total hold off time ends up being 50 milliseconds because you're waiting for the signal to round trip. And so the, the effect is you might lose or miss, uh, miss events. And so that's when you move from like um, auto trigger to normal trigger or single trigger or something like that where, well, you get out of auto normal single so that the trigger system is, con is I shouldn't do it like this because trigger system is just watching, right? But anytime the scope is doing something, generally the trigger can't watch. And so that's, that's where hold off time comes into play. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks.